What in the world? I wrote, looked down in my notes, and it says James chapter 10, verse 1 through 4. And we've been in Matthew for a while, so I'm like, I thought, I've got the wrong message, but I just, I don't know how I come up with James. Okay, we're going to go Matthew chapter 10, and that'll be more in line with what my notes say. And uh, we'll begin Matthew chapter 10 and verse 1. It says, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first, Simon, who is called Peter, Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, the publican, James, the son of Alphaeus, Labaius, whose surname is uh, Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Now, we began this text a couple of weeks ago with the intent to, uh, uh, to look closely at each one of these 12 disciples uh, as they are listed here. We've already looked at, at Simon Peter pretty extensively, and uh, as I told you, Simon Peter is uh, the second most mentioned person in the New Testament, uh, second only to Jesus. And so there's a lot to learn about Simon Peter. As we go through the list, these it's going to be less and less that we know about each one of these uh, uh, disciples. But uh, uh, we now are going to look closely at Andrew. And, of course, we know that Andrew was Simon Peter's uh, brother. Like Peter, uh, Andrew was an unlikely candidate for becoming an apostle, uh, let alone uh, one of the, the uh, 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 four apostles, Peter, James, John, and, and Andrew, that were the kind of the Lord's inner circle. Uh, I mean, you take, you take Peter and Andrew both. They were fishermen. They were rough. Uh, the two of them, they just didn't have a lot of credentials that you would think that they would be brought into the uh, inner circle of the Son of God, but they were. Um, over time, they became a, a central part again, not that they had elevated positions over the rest of the disciples, because they didn't. It just seems that, that over time they grew closer to the Lord and, uh, and uh, were privy to to more intimate uh, uh, knowledge of, of certain things. And so uh, it, it just shows us, though, that it's not talent, it's not pedigree uh, that Jesus is looking for, but rather it's people who are surrendered to his lordship. And it does. It seems that these four were just uh, had a deeper commitment and uh, were, were more devoted. And there again, not to say anything negative about the remainder of the disciples, but these four uh, stood out. Uh, they were very... Uh, they had an uncommon uh, calling upon their lives, but they were very common, uh, each one of them themselves. You know, you think about all the paintings that we see of the disciples, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the stained glass windows that, that depict the disciples in, in churches across the land and this sort of thing. And, and it can be, a, it, it can be a, a little bit misleading because some of these present them as having halos over their head and things like this, and the idea that somehow that they uh, uh, have a, uh, uh, an elevated position or something above humans or other, or other disciples and this sort of thing. And that's the first thing from the truth. In fact, we often hear people refer to the disciples with saint in front of their name, Saint Peter and Saint Andrew, and uh, that too can be misleading. Uh, uh, and lend towards us thinking that somehow that these men were different on a different spiritual plane than everybody else, and 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 that is just simply not the case. They didn't they didn't have a higher standing. They didn't have a higher heavenly status, if you will. Uh, they were they they were saints, okay. But so are you. They were saints in the sense that uh, uh, they belonged to the Lord, that they were set apart for His service. Uh, they were made holy, if you will, by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And in that sense, every one of us are saints, okay? But when you hear of St. Peter or St. Andrew or whatever, the, the reference lends towards them being something that's above other servants of the Lord, and, and that's not the case, okay? And so, uh, really, uh, in reality, we're on equal ground when you think about it with the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter, 
uh, and Andrew and all them, we're on equal ground with them in the sense of, of, of spiritual positioning. Will we ever get to walk in with Jesus three and a half years and it, with him flesh and blood? No. But in a, in a, on a spiritual status, spiritual position goes, we're on equal ground with them. And that doesn't mean that we can't um, stand out in our service because these fellows certainly did stand out. And any woman is, is capable of standing out in their service to the Lord in the sense that, uh, uh, that, that we can rise to the occasion through commitment and willingness and, and dedication and these sort of things and cause us to be more standout servants of the Lord. But, uh, but, but beyond that, there's, there's no elevated positions. It's just uh, we're just common people, uh, and they were just common people, and that really should encourage us because, uh, because we, there's no limitations. To, uh, like I said, uh, Peter and, and Andrew and the other one had uh, high education, uh, any great pedigree or credentials that would have made them anything special. Uh, they, were just, uh, they were just committed and available. And so we'll look a little closer at Andrew here. Even before Andrew met Jesus, he was, it seems that he was a godly man. He was devoted. In fact, let me ask you to turn to John chapter 1, and uh, we'll read a couple of verses over there. I don't usually bounce you guys too much, but tonight we're going to move over there to John chapter 1. Now, something that we may not notice in our regular run-of-the-mill reading was Andrew was actually a follower of John the Baptist. He was so meaning that he was a devoted Jew. He was already following uh, the, the, the pre-runner, if you will, the, the voice in the wilderness, uh, John, John the Baptist. Beginning in verse um, 35, it says in, in John chapter 1, it says, And again, the next day a, uh, after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. So he's telling his, his disciples, Hey, this, here's the Lamb of God. Here comes the Son of God. Here's the guy that you're going to follow. And, verse 37, and the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And uh, goes on to say, Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and saith unto them, What seek ye? And they said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, uh, being interpreted master, where dwellest thou? And he saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother, Simon, and saith unto him, we, will ha we have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, son of, uh, son of Jonah, Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is interpretation, a stone. And so we can go back to our text uh, back in, in Matthew uh, chapter 10, but I want to see a few things about this. Um, we see that Andrew was a follower of John the Baptist, so he was already a, a godly man. Uh, then at the, at the uh, urging uh, of John the Baptist, he leaves uh, that following and begins to follow Jesus. But something that's interesting is his initial commitment to following Jesus was not a full-time deal. We see him begin to follow Jesus here, but somewhere along the way, he and Peter, both of them began to follow Jesus here. Somewhere along the way, they went back to fishing, some. We don't know to what level, because over in Matthew chapter 4, which we've already studied several months ago, you find that, uh, that Jesus came upon them and says, hey, I'm calling you to be fisher of men. And they began to follow him from that point. In fact, the scripture says, and they straightway left their nets and followed him. So from that point forward, it was a, it was a, a full-time situation. They, they left off fishing. They, 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 they went about following Jesus uh, completely, okay? And so um, uh, there's just not a lot of detail about Andrew in, in these gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke say nearly nothing about him outside of uh, his name being listed, okay, like it is here in chapter 10. But the Gospel of John basically gives us what little detail we have about Andrew and, and who he was. First of all, we just read, it tells us about when he uh, uh, left following John the Baptist and began to follow the Lord, and he brought his brother, he immediately told Peter about the Messiah, brought him 
uh, to Jesus. And then in John chapter um, 6, when uh, Jesus fed the 5,000, it tells us that Andrew was the one that had found the young man with the five loaves and the two fishes and took that young man to Jesus, okay? Uh, John chapter 6 makes note of that. Then a third time, uh, John speaks, the, the Gospel of John speaks about Andrew, is in John chapter 12, when some God fearing Greeks had come uh, seeking Jesus, and Andrew and Philip, the scripture tells us, came and told Jesus that they, these men were looking for him, okay? And so those three accounts are pretty much the extent of what we have, uh, information we have about An Andrew. But even with that, we can deduce a couple of things, okay? Uh, from, from what little is spoken about him. Number one is he had tremendous faith, okay? In his bringing that young boy and, and, uh, with, that had the fishes and the bread to Jesus, what's implied there is that he understood Jesus could do something with that, okay? There's no way that he would have known probably that Jesus would be able to feed 5,000 with that, but, but the simple fact that he brought them to Jesus implies that, uh, that he knew Jesus could use that, okay? Now, we know that uh, he had already witnessed Jesus turning water into wine, so he knew Jesus was capable, and so certainly he had the faith to know that the Lord was going to do something in this situation. Of course, we know the rest of the story. Uh, the miracle was that he fed uh, 5,000 uh, people, okay? So he had faith. The second thing about Andrew that we know is he was a humble servant. You think about this. All throughout the writings of the gospel, he's primarily referred to as the brother of Simon Peter, okay? It's kind of like Troy Aikman being your brother. You, you don't have a name. This is Troy Aikman's brother, okay? Right? You know, so he was kind of in the shadows of his brother along the way. Uh, uh, he, he uh, though he was a part of the inner circle of Jesus, those four disciples, uh, uh, Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. He was a part of the four. However, he pretty much kind of stayed in the shadows of the other three. In fact, at the transfiguration of Christ, it was James, John, and Peter that were taken to the mount to see that, okay? And so he was kind of left behind. But with all of that, Scripture never speaks or, or makes note of him being disgruntled of him uh, being resentful or jealous or murmuring about being uh, overshadowed or left behind or having an obscure role or anything of this nature. He, and, and we know that, that, that Scripture uh, records the weaknesses of the disciples. So had that weakness been there, it's, it's little doubt that God would have told us about it. But no, it just seems that Andrew was content uh, to just be in the place that he was allowed to be. And, you know... It doesn't matter what place you're in. If you're with Jesus, it's all good, right? And so, so uh, it, it's, it really serves as a model uh, to you and I uh, as, as Christians and to all believers, if you will, uh, to be willing to quietly, humbly serve in whatever capacity the Lord has given us, uh, whether it be something that's notable or whether it be something that's totally obscure and unseen by anybody but God. Uh, it's essentially he, willing to play uh, to be in second place, if you will, willing to be unnoticed, uh, be somewhat hidden, and, and uh, um, while other people around us are more high profile, maybe getting recognized or getting the credit. And, and God uses people like Andrew all the time. Again, those that are just in the shadows. Uh, we, we have so many servants here in, in, in this church that are uh, kind of along those lines, and, and it's really... Only God can calculate the effectiveness of the people that, uh, that are doing things that, that go unnoticed and this sort of thing and uh, just see the work needs to be done and they do it and uh, without any uh, recognition at all. And, and usually the backbone of any strong ministry is made up of individuals like that. Again, the Andrews of, of, of the church and people that are occupying obscure roles, uh, uh, roles if you will, along the way and that's good enough for them they don't want more they don't ask for more and so i don't understand why god chooses to place others uh in more notable positions why god chooses to take one preacher and and elevate him in in his uh uh um, um not an elevator wasn't a good word but uh, 
uh, to bless his ministry and his, his following or whatever, more so than other people. I don't understand why God uh, makes uh, one person a dynamic leader and another person just that kind of works behind the scenes. That's all, that's all up to God. Only God knows those, those things. But, uh, but it does not mean in any way, form, or fashion that there's greater rewards for those that are in recognizable position uh, uh, than, than those that are in obscure position. That's not, not at all. And really it's encouraging me to know that God doesn't necessarily look upon their gifts, the talents, the abilities. Uh, uh, he, he doesn't look upon those in, in the way of evaluating our fruit. It's, it, it's, it's, a, it's our availability, it's our willingness, our humility, our commitment, our faithfulness that, 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 that he looks at as far as judging the fruits that you and I have to offer. He sees guys like Andrew, and, uh, and uh, has, he's, he's got just as much fruit as guys like the Apostle Peter that we studied last week, okay? And so uh, he just, uh, um, Peter was always in a, a noticeable row, and his brother Andrew was in an unnoticeable row, but I believe we'll probably get to heaven and find that they both had an abundance of fruit, okay? Let me read to you. Uh, what an old-time author wrote about Andrew, and then we'll close this deal and, and let get you guys home. It says this, Gathering together the traces of character found in Scripture about Andrew, we find neither the writer of an epistle, nor the founder of a church, nor a leading figure in the apostolic age, but simply an intimate disciple of Jesus Christ, ever anxious that others should know the spring of spiritual joy and share the blessing he so highly prized, a man moderate, uh, a man of moderate endowment, who scarcely redeemed his earth, his early promise. Simple-minded, sympathetic, without neither dramatic power or heroic spirit, yet with that clinging confidence in Christ that brought him into the inner circle of the twelve. Pretty eloquent speaking there, but it, he he nailed it. So you know, if if you're here and your duties or your service to the Lord is in an area that's unseen, uh, let me encourage you by Andrew's example. Uh, your role is just as God-honoring, just as God-pleasing as the role of myself or anybody else who would stand in the pulpit or, 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 or any other role. It, which it's, it's not about what, we, what uh, uh, the, the level of talent or what's seen and what's not seen. It's about availability, willingness, and a humble uh, submission to the Lordship of Christ, and Andrew certainly had that. So next time we're together, we'll take a look and see if we can find out a little bit about the sons of Zebedee, John and James, okay? Appreciate you guys. We'll go ahead and stand and be dismissed in a word of prayer. Hope you have a great remainder of the week. See you back here on Sunday. Call somebody. Check on them if you haven't seen them in a while, and uh, and be faithful yourself. And let me just say this, uh, just not to throw out names, but when you notice... Uh, like the Sacketts have been getting their kids here every service over the last few weeks, okay? Other people are doing that. When you notice a parent doing that, brag on them when you see them Sunday. Say, man, I've been seeing the kids here. I've been seeing the boys here. I really appreciate what you're doing with your kiddos and stuff because that encourages those families. They're doing they're, All these young families are, are doing good and getting their kids here. So take a moment and brag on those people, and it'll go a long ways, okay? Yes, ma'am. Grayson Cook? Oh, okay. Uh, is he sick? Or? Doing some tests on Grayson Cook. Okay. All right. Jeff, will you lead us in prayer, please?